I think there's a horse in it that's worth the fiver. Hello team, I hope you are doing well. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Racing YouTube channel. Before we go into things, I do just want to say a massive, massive thank you for the, all the support on the build-up to this National Hunt season. We're now at Chepstow Week, and how good does it feel? It feels incredible. Um, and that's why we've got this video, a big video. We've drafted in Gavin Lynch, a legend of, of racing YouTube, obviously formerly of Up in the Andes. Not done that for a year, but he's still as sharp as ever and it was great to sit down with him yesterday with Andrew and go through those big talking points and we did that to celebrate the new season but also to celebrate 18,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel an absolutely incredible number and we do massively 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 appreciate all the support that you've given us and also I did just want to mention King of Answers who ran third in a bumper at Banger really 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 good run we were expecting him to, to really produce the goods later this season, over hurdles, up in trip, but he finished third in a bumper place, didn't expect that, and uh, no, really, really excited about what he can do this season. We're gonna have plenty of fun with him. He's knocked around in the early part of the race, really stuck to his task and stayed on well, so really looking forward to him going over hurdles. The team were delighted, and we're gonna have so much fun with him this season. So if you do wanna get involved, hit that first line in the description, and do get involved in King of Answers. We loose into the wrestle this season. I can't wait, Andrew can't wait, and the whole team at Claymore Racing can't wait too. If you do enjoy this video, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and we'll get into it. Let's go. Welcome along to the Let's Talk Racing YouTube channel in association with Racing TV today. There's three of us. Why is there three of us? Well, you finally found an Irish person that can actually talk sense, Josh. <laughs> uh, so we've imported in Gavin Lynch all the way from Ireland. Gavin, how are you? I'm good. I'm uh, not as posh as Andrew, but uh, hopefully people can understand me. See, see, that was it. All right, so uh, you're probably the first. <laughs> you're the first Irish person I've ever met. No, you're, you're the. You're the, <laughs> the first, <laughs> you're, the, you're the first like um, person who, who is from Ireland <laughs> who I've probably become friends with. And I, I thought you had a very normal accent, and then people in the comments have, have yeah. since let me know that that it's it's yeah, just so right, it's where, where, where you're from, where you grow up. And <laughs> yeah, Fox Rock. That's what the money is. Yeah, well, beside leopard stand, so, you know, Dad knew what he was doing growing up beside leopard stand, so there you go. He did, and that's why you're such a big racing fan. Um, on this video, we're going to be talking to Gavin about the season. Obviously, this is the most exciting time of year. We've got Punchestown today, Punchestown um, tomorrow. We've got Chepstow this weekend. We'll be looking towards that right towards the end as well. Um, but we want to pick your brains more than most because we were both big fans of you when you're doing up in the ante. You've got something on your own now. You've got your own website. Yeah, GavinLynchRacing.com. Sure, have a look. Uh, did it last year, doing it again this year, and it seemed to go well enough last year, so we'll see how we get on. Well, you are a, a god in the YouTube uh, racing world, so hopefully we can pick your brains as much as possible. Very much looking forward to doing that. Um, if you do enjoy this video, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and we do look forward to your comments down below. Um, and obviously, if you subscribe to the channel, we get to do more cool stuff like this, so please go and do that. Um, but before we properly start, we're, I would say, me more than you, um, a pretty novice punter, I would say. As we've got you in the room, have you got any punting pointers for me? Uh, just, I suppose, maybe, uh, the, for me, the most important thing is to keep a profit and loss, uh, whether it's in a diary, it's on a spreadsheet. It'll only take you five minutes a week, but if you can prove to yourself and nobody else that you can make a few quid, well then, it means maybe you could bet a bit heavier if you wanted to. And also I'd say specialise, don't be betting on football and tennis and rugby with the Rugby World Cup on and horse racing and flat and Dundalk. Um, because things have got hard in the last few years with morning prices and 48 hour decks and there's a few other reasons. I actually don't bet on the flat anymore. I always did for the last 20 odd years. Um, but recently I just do the National Hunt from kind of now-ish to, to say the end of March. Um, but yeah, I'd say definitely keep a profit and loss. Uh, and definitely specialised, don't bet on too many things. But it takes a long time to get okay at punting. Like in my 20s, I was a bad, bad punter. Mm. And then. Just hope for us, yeah. Just hope. <laughs> See, in your 20s, you know nothing. <laughs> you couldn't know anything in your 20s. Yeah. But um, uh, I then became a bookmaker for a year because everybody I knew back in, in, the, in those days, a long time ago, uh, the internet wasn't really around, so you couldn't study videos. And uh, so I said, well, if everybody's losing, I'll be a bookie. So after a year, I only made five grand. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to try and do it and do it properly. So 
it's just a, it's a lot of boring hard work of uh, looking and looking at videos and trying to form an opinion and with Irish racing in particular there are a few things that you have to get to know as well and um, yeah, just as I said, maybe specialise, but definitely keep a profit and loss. You don't have to show it to anybody. I remember when myself and Emery started living together, and uh, when we were engaged, um, you know, I had to, I had a diary, and I said, I tell you what, and I left it on top of the uh, one of the units in the kitchen. I said, you ever want to look at it? So she she got used to it after a few years. But so. <laughs> well, you, you've taken specialising to the next level. You only go Paul Nolan. Oliver McKinnon. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really have gone down some bad rabbit holes. What would you say to that though? I feel, especially for some people, quite a lot of not issues is that you, you can become too sentimental with hunting. You've had a horse, it's one big for you one day and stuff yeah. like that. What would you try to get out of the one? Sounds the, like what, a therapy session. Yeah, no, 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 no that's alright, it's good, it's good. <laughs> but what are the worst habits that you think people can pick up and how do you go about rectifying? I definitely wouldn't be sentimental. Not a bit. I had my favourite horses, cooked, you know, cooked. Mm. I was there when Denoli won in Leopardstown and all these, you know, I was there when Foggin won, etc, etc, so some amazing days, my brother's horse would supreme, but I wouldn't be sentimental, uh, definitely don't follow horses too much, but also I would think that people are too quick to complain about jockeys, or as I'd say, give out about a jockey, and then they're, they're forgiving the horse too much, too easily. And they're saying, oh, you got a terrible ride. So the next day they'll back him again and he won't win again. Mm. It's not always the jockey's fault. It generally, it's like golf. It comes down to a lack of ability on the horses we have most of the time. So, Is that the same then towards Cheltenham? How do people get an edge at Cheltenham? Because you spent years and years and years looking towards a festival anti-post <coughs> with the race of post and, and you're successful doing it. Um, it's what we kind of do as well. It's what we're trying to do. It's tricky now than it was before though. Yeah, it's trickier now because the prices aren't as good. Mm. Uh, even like even on a daily basis, the morning prices are not good anymore. So there's more value in the afternoons than there is in the mornings. Cheltenham as well. Um, some of the prices are terrible. I was telling you earlier on that I think it's roughly three years ago. I put um, Fernie Hollow into a docket into a lucky fifteen in kind of September October time because he was fourteen to one. He was after winning the bumper. He showed loads of toe. You said to yourself, appreciate it, go for Ballymore. Mm. And that probably would have happened, and I think Fernie Hollow would have bolted up in that year's Supreme if he was there. But he was 14, whereas the horse that runs tomorrow, a time to share, is 4 to 1. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean that there, is, that there isn't value. There is value out there, but you just have to look a bit harder. Um, I definitely, one thing is definitely don't back a horse for two races. Because mm. if you back a horse, just do the maths for a minute. We, if you stick a tenner on a horse at 8 to 1, just say Fasal Big was 8 for, this, for the Arkell and the Turners, just say. And you backed him uh, for both. Say he did win one of them, you get back 90 quid, you've speculated 20, you've made a profit of 70, so you're back to 72 winner. Yeah. Whereas people get coddled by thinking that it's 8 to 1, less a small bit of a loss, but it's, it's, that's not a good idea. I wouldn't uh, take too many chances on guessing which race that a horse is going to run in. I think you need to be really set in your mind that it's going to go for this race. So with that at the moment, I think probably mares is a good way of looking at it. Mm. Because the mares are going to go for mares races. Lossy Mouth will go for the mares hurdle, etc, etc, etc. The mares chase. You know what I mean? It's less yeah. complicated there. because There's only one option for the mares novice hurdler. Uh, there's the chase, there's the mares hurdle. So that's probably not a bad way to look at the moment, is to kind of concentrate maybe on the mares. Uh, I think that's uh, definitely a few points that we can take into consideration this season. Um, obviously this time of year there's been lots of racing over the summer. I wanted to pick your brains about some of the horses that have run over the summer before we look forward. Um, I suppose the highlight of summer is it fair to say Sharjah? What was, what's your opinions of Sharjah? Yeah, well, it's been very good. Uh, I think it's one of those ones where it's a bit of a sink or swim for connections. Like if you go down that route, obviously you get a few horrible incidents where older horses go novice chasing and something happens and then you know you won't hear the end of it. But I think the way he's, he's attacked his fences in his, in his two runs so far would indicate that he likes doing it, he, he enjoys the game. Obviously a very high class hurdler. It's the type of horse, you know, could he place or potentially win an early season grade one? I suspect they'll be targeting the Drinmore and back perhaps. Um, you'd think that there's plenty more younger, fresher leg horses that are going to end up usurping him. But he's put down a, a fair enough mark and with his hurdles form, you, you'd you think that he can scale up to maybe being a grade two, maybe even a grade one novice chaser this year. Yeah, that's it. I think six time grade one winning hurdle, you kind of think if he makes that transition, he could dominate. You're slightly unsure. What, what about you? What do you reckon? 
Yeah, winner of four matches and hurdles, yeah. so a class act. Um, uh, the highest he ever got, to, I think, was around one six five or thereabouts. He's, he finished up with one five five hurdler. He's ten years old, is the thing. He's turning eleven. Didn't uh, stop for him. Well, I was just going to say the obvious comparison is Fahin, same owner, same trainer, same jockey usually, and. Um, Fahin was 11 turning 12 uh, when he went and I was chasing and then he won the grade one at Limerick and he won the grade one at the DRF so he's only beaten a length in the turners but obviously Fahin was a better horse than, than Sharjah officially when they were at their very best Fahin was 176 and Sharjah was 165 so it's 11 pounds obviously um, Sharjah so far he was excellent going again Tipperary jumped really well like he won't be a big price for the gym more uh, he probably has set the best form so far of any horse for the turners, but then again, there's literally nothing else that has ran. But so he won't go run the arc up. Uh, the fact that he stepped up to two and a half and eighteen again the other day is a bonus for connections that he might be a bit easier because he's not as quick as he was. But like he's twenty to one there for the turners. If somebody was giving you four or five to one to be placed, he might have a chance to be placed, Jim. We just you don't think he's going to be young enough, fresh enough to, to go and win a race like that. Like, believe it or not, Fahim went off 3 to 1 favourite to win the Turners, you know. As I said, he's not fine, but um, if he wins the Drinmore, he's only going to be a 6 to 1 yeah, shot, you true. know. I think the one, one thing as well that I'd be interested in, just with his record at Leopardstown, I know he's probably not necessarily got the speed for two miles anymore, but wouldn't surprise me if he turned up at a Christmas or a DRF being a second or third string behind maybe a Fasol Vega. And we just saw last year at the DRF, for example, Ilete Tom picking up pieces with Fasal Vega blowing out. You know, he's the type of horse that he'd be ridden for, probably ridden to run well and ridden to place. And, you know, he could pick up pieces in those types of races. It must be one of the strangest things ever that Shard used to win at Christmas and then he'd run at the end of January as yeah, it used to be. Hopeless. And then hopeless. That was a slightly yeah. different track, but it's still mind-boggling that it happened every year. And, and you just got to hope that that doesn't happen no offence that he can continue that ball. Personally, I, I don't know, I think he might have a chance to drill more. I think it'll go from south after that. Um, Mystical Power, one of Willie's many novices or, or bumper winners this, this season so far. Obviously, when you're out of any power, you're going to have a lot of people talking By about Galileo. You. By Galileo. Now, I'm told two very, very pushy parents of yeah, those. I would, I would imagine. Very pushy. It, it, that, that's just like the equivalent of being out of Cameron Diaz by Cristiano Ronaldo. Like you're just destined to be reasonably talented or good looking or something like that. Um, <laughs> do we think that what he's shown so far? It, it, can he turn into? Could he? Could he go and win a royal bond? Could he go and? You'd imagine if he turned that he's only a four-year-old. Yeah. He wasn't impressive the first day of his bumper, but to go and win in Galway, uh, Paul gave it a super ride because early on he was very, very keen. <coughs> Excuse me, and Paul took the pull, pulled it back to about sixth. He traded quite big in running that day because he was just acting the maggot a small bit. Came through to win very easy. Uh, the horse that was second was ran three times since, didn't win the Lartigue, uh, Samui, I think he's up to 128. Now that day, uh, Mr. Power was getting seven pounds, but you'd still say it was a 137, 138 mm. performance. For your first run over hurdles, uh, it was very, very decent. Uh, if he starts to behave himself a bit better and gets more mature, which he will, like, you want to get to, to, to win a Supreme, you want to get to 155, so he's a lot to improve, but quite quickly. Do, do, do either of you worry that why is he running in the summer? If he's that good, will he usually sends his proper novices out? end of November, start of December. It, yeah, I think it's very easy to say that, but I think that's probably changing slightly. You know, Champ Kylie won a maiden hurdle at Galway last year. You know, well, he just saw one as maiden hurdle in May, I think. Yeah, so like, I don't think it's something that I would just... Marina, you know? Well, it, it, exactly, yeah. you know, so I don't think it's something to really hang your hat on as if, you know, he can't be good. Like, I think there's another decent enough um, novice of Willie's high class hero, Michael Den Bartlett's rules. He's been running in the summer, but he's, you know, not a yeah. bad stick in the same stage. So. He, he does have to improve, you know, you saw a horse like Quick Brabham winning a kind of summer races and then going on to win a Royal Bond, it can easily be done. I'd be worried that day at Galway, race slightly fell apart, second favourite hypotenuse ran really poorly, changed stables and has won, won a race since, but 
he'd need to scrub up his jumping. I wouldn't fancy him for a Royal Bond if he went straight there. He'd have to have another run for me. Yeah, it'd be interesting to get another one into him before the Royal Bond or not, because he definitely was very green, very obviously too keen. He did a lot wrong to the one, but like you couldn't do any of those things to win a Royal Bond. Is it that great for it that he could, could go? Yep, there was a two, yeah. two mile, uh, I think the Ferrock. Is Nabbas. that the one that hurt Kim Desai around in last year or not? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my mate Mozzie won it, didn't he, a couple of years ago? He did. Abercadabras yeah. won it one year as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably the, the likely stepping stone. It'll be a tougher credentials for him. Uh, I think uh, another exciting horse, and people will be wondering what your opinion on is, is Aurora Vega, who, again, out of a superstar mare that we went through for Sutton. She's done no wrong. She's won a listed bumper at this point. Again, I don't know why it is, but when they're running at this time of year or before this time of year, I, I just have my slout, slight doubts. I, I like to think of a Mullins bumper horse going to Lapis Town at Christmas, maybe starting out there, then go to the DRF, then kicking on to, to Cheltenham. That's kind of been the route that all the top ones have gone down in recent years. Yeah, again, those things can be you know, looked at it in one, one or two ways. You know, we, we'd have never sat here this time last year. I don't think any of us would have thought that Dream Dejer was going to win the champion bumper. He's won two pretty Mickey Mouse bumpers yeah. over Christmas yeah. and it took a long time, came back for the DRF. I don't think we'll see Aurora Vega until either Leopardstown for the Mayor's bumper at the Dublin Racing Festival or, or Cheltenham. I don't think she can run between then and now if she wants to run in a Cheltenham bumper. So uh, she was very impressive. I'm going to be a slightly biased, I own a tiny part of the second in that list of bumpers. So <laughs> very good, well I, done. I want, I want that form to be as good as possible, sharp object ground very well. So, so in your in your head, Aurora Vega should be threes for the champion bumper. Ah uh, yeah, she can't be kept please. But <laughs> no, look, she, she'd have to improve again. But you know, you couldn't throw her out of potentially winning the mayor's bumper at Leopardstown. She's done nothing wrong so far. I think to back up what you said, that uh, I don't think she was setting the world on fire before. Yeah. She ever ran, so that was one of the reasons maybe she ran in the summer. But she's improving and improving. I'd say that the next time you'll see her will be the DRF, I'd imagine, the mayor's bumper, yeah. So, but maybe she could keep improving, yeah. Yeah, no, she's a, she is fascinating. I think there's probably a couple of more horses that ran over the summer that you could you could look towards Cheltenham. I think Salvador Ziggy has, has done plenty well, plenty, plenty right, um, and is, I think he finds himself favourite for the National Hunt Chase now. Is that fair? I think it is fair. Um, funnily enough, interesting here in Gordon Elliott uh, this afternoon at Punchestown, the horse is going to run in the American Grand National. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a slightly unorthodox route. It's, it's, it's a strange way of getting there, but I suppose Hewitt did it last year to get to a Gold Cup and was running a cracking race. So, <laughs> you know, who am I to, to question it? Um, he, he'd have to have a chance. He's that kind of archetypical, like, his run in the summer has gotten his runs in. You know, Galvin did it and uh, Chemical Energy did it last yeah, I was year. Say, remind you of the Chemical Energy. So, hard to know. You'd like to think that there's going to be a slightly classier horse that could beat a Salvador Ziggy. I loved him last year. I fancied him for the attempts all, all year long. Um, the, I, I didn't hear that Gordon Elliott quote today about the American Grand National. That would send shivers down my spine. I wouldn't want that at all. Um, yeah, I, I think there might be one class here. And I think in, in the last couple of years, you have found like a Statler, a Gala de Manil, these these like, maybe, I don't want to bring up the National Entree to last year, you might still be sensitive about that one. Yeah, um, but a, a slightly classier horse has, has won in recent years. There's been smaller fields that definitely played into a class your horse, they go slower, they can quicken up and then you can, yeah, class the, comes the, out. Yeah, to change the trip to three mile six probably mm. didn't do any harm either. Yeah. Um, Salvador Ziggy, second of the attempts last year for your off 147. Goes and wins three chases, second of the Kerry National off 150, is now up to 153. As you say, I'd agree with what you said, could see it finishing for the fourth maybe in the National mm. chase, but would want to improve again, I think, to be, uh, to be the winner of it. I think there's a horse in it that's worth the fiver. Uh, flanking maneuver time by no one made. Uh, he's only worth the fiver because he was off before injured. He was off for two years, but last year when he came back, <clears throat> he ran in Navin behind Churchstone Warrior and Mallor Mission. Uh, was right on top of them at the line. That was his first one for two years. Mallor Mission, I thought, should have won the National Chase. To me, he got the worst ride of the festival. Kicked on at the top of the hill and was starting to get tired, maybe a two out, but if it was held on to it, might have won the National Chase. So, flanking maneuver won recently in Navan last week, or sorry, in Ferry House. <coughs> and I think he'd have no chance in uh, the Brown Advisory. So, I think maybe they might be tempted to go for the, the National Hunt Chase, considering the Navan one. 
and uh, Gigan's turn won't be four with Tiger Roll, so I don't think the reverse to run the horse with. So, what price is it? He's 25 to 1 with Bet365, 20 to 1 with Carl's and Labrooks. Just, he might be worth a fiver, I think, coming over, yeah. Might be worth a fiver. Suddenly, this time next week, he's going to be five to one favourite. No, 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 no. The final one I want to talk about is um, is Redstone, who <coughs> why has he got to go on to do that to my, my mate, King of Kingsfield? <laughs> and see, again, going back to the start of what Gavin said about sentimental punting, you know, I, I'm going to have to give away some of these Paul Nolan horses this year because they're not good for me. King of Kingsfield, I'm, I think you're going to have to send him adrift at some stage. I, I think I genuinely have issues because even watching that, I, I saw a, a Gavin Cromwell horse who wasn't really fancy before go and beat him convincingly. He didn't even look uh, that revved up, looked like he did pretty easily. And yet I'm still thinking, what's the worst outcome? What, what's the best outcome here? Could King of King still be a, a Martin Pike horse? So we're looking at handicaps. <laughs> I genuinely think I've got a slight, <laughs> slight issue. And yeah. 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 The only thing um, you can, uh, the only strike you can touch is that he was given the winner eight pounds. So there you go. <laughs> so I say, look. Gavin, please come every week. Um, I think the interesting thing, just I'd say about those, is Gavin Cromwell's quite a. I think he's an excellent trainer. Yeah. He goes through streaks, and at the moment, everything he touches seems to be winning. Mm. He had won another maiden hurdle, um, with poorly fee of, of Gordon Elias getting beat today. So it just seems everything's winning, and then they'll go through a, a patch during the winter where they won't win, and then they could come back to life in the spring. Yeah. So, I'm just not sure how to take all that form at the moment. I think so, Redstone will end up a nice chaser, especially over two and a half, three miles. But going forward this season, King of Kingsfield is the one to take from that race. No. <laughs> Maybe the Martin Pike. <laughs> there we go. You never know. A few runs, get him off 139 yeah, yeah. in a Martin Pike. Yeah. Two and a half miles, he's always wanted it. Has he? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah, so, so we've got a, a tip there for, for the. Um, but that's one on chase. I think that is, it is interesting. I think at this time over the time, is, is there a horse that, that catches your eye at all? Because I'm looking to the market and struggling. Yeah, I'm struggling um, a little bit. I'd, I'd have two in my mind at, at bigger prices for, for the brand advisory at the moment. I'd keep Sandra Clegain and I'd keep um, Nick Rocket on side. I think he'll run in that. I see some people thinking he might go for a national on chase. I don't see it myself. Uh, but I think he's nice. And the way you know, he won that Fairy House Novice Herd, Willie Mullins, the horse that run in that race have typically gone on to run in the brand advisory the next year so that's maybe I'm not saying it's an angle or anything but it's, it's something to be interesting both of them are around the 2025 20, to one shot but I wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be mad keen on, on backing anything at the moment it, it's, a, it's very tricky and I'm looking forward to, to see how things develop over the next couple of weeks um, we asked you on Twitter for some questions for all of us to answer. I'm going to quickly fire through them now. The first one comes from John Francis. He asks, uh, what race do you think Fasal Vega will run in at the festival? So he goes chasing. Yeah. By the way, they play great music in this pub. They do play great music. This is the Sydney Arms in Chelsea. Yeah. Wonderful place. We drink Just to say, really race cool. TV, you're giving these lads too much money. <laughs> if, they, if they can live in Chelsea. Yeah. Well, or, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> what race? Well, Fast Omega run in a so, festival. I uh, I was thinking they'd run in the arc of myself. Yeah. <clears throat> Willie Mullins, uh, he would have a score to settle with uh, Marine National. Barry Connell never had horses with him, so maybe he'd like to give him a little nudge and win the arc. So I rang Jared Bryan yesterday for you. He was one of the two owners of Fast Vega. And uh, I said to him, uh, Jared, what do you think? I'm doing a podcast. I said, you know the two posh fellas on the, on the internet? I did you know who we were? <laughs> <laughs> he did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, the last one of the questions is uh, which race is Basel Vega running? And he said, do you expect me to know what William Mullins is going to do? Yeah. And I said, right, Jared, I'll tell you what. You, but I'll give you even money each of two, even money the Arkham, even money the Turners, a hundred quid bet. Where are you sticking a hundred quid? Ah, probably the Arkham. He's Stakes two miles. Right, do you, do you, can you, ah, look it. That's a guess. He's yeah. only guessing. C can you see a world where he reverses the form in Marine National. Should we come down to jumping? Yeah. Josh, we don't know. Like, the one thing I'd say that will help Fas Vega, I love, I love, but I like keen going horses going chase them because they like to get on with it. And usually the keen going fella, he loves attacking the fence because he's just a bit aggressive. Uh, so he could be brilliant over a fence and if Marine National wasn't. But don't forget, like, um, Fasal Vega had a very bad prep for Cheltenham that the run in, in the DRF was a blowout. 
So to have only what was it six weeks to the Supreme? Look, I, I, if they both jump the same, you'd fancy Marine National, but I just wouldn't totally say for sure that he'd beat Fasal Vega. Agree? Yeah, well, you can't rule it out. And um, the one thing I just think I, I agree with Gavin completely about the way he goes. I don't look at him running personally, his running style personally, and think he wants to step up and trip in the slightest. Um, he goes with a lot of enthusiasm, at times perhaps even a hint too much. Maybe a fence will calm him down ever so slightly, but I think he's a, you know, he's potentially a very exciting two mile novice chase. Fast or slow? Was it a fluke at Punchestown? I wouldn't want to back him to uphold the form, definitely. <laughs> um, look, he was very good. Is, is he a Gold Cup contender? No, not for me. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't just. I wouldn't agree. Um, he has to have a bit of a squeak simply because he's only exposed. He's only seven. He's the same age as Gallop and Deschamps. He won over fences at three. Uh, since then, he'd only four runs over fences. Now, if you go and watch last year's John Durkin when he finished behind Gallop and Deschamps, apart from the winner, he was the eye catcher in the race. He travelled brilliant, jumped brilliant. They then dropped him back to two mile one, probably with a handicap chase and chat in my mind. Runs a crack on the ultimate behind Corrick Rambler, who we know what did after. Do you, do you have to consider Corrick for a gold cap if, if fast or slow to finish second? To he possibly would, yeah. Uh, like when I say for a gold cup, I don't think he'd beat Gallup in the shop mm. again, like he did a punch down fast or slow, but. Like, he's very unexposed. Um, the performance in Punches Town was really good. He's now up to Raven 168. Raven's game is 172, and I think Gallop in the Champ is 179. So he's 11 pounds to find, but he's only got four pounds to find with the horse in second. So I definitely could see him being the first three or four, definitely. What's your thoughts on uh, the champion bump form this year? Obviously, that's the one race most people look towards with regards to future novice hurdle prospects. Do you think a dream to share is? Is the real deal. I think he's very good. He runs tomorrow. People are worried about his jumping. John Kiley trains him, so we'll see how tomorrow goes. But I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think it was a great shot in the bumper. No, I think it was. I think it was average enough. Uh, what makes you think that? Fact of file is a good staying horse in second. Uh, Captain T. Paul Nolan or Paul Nichols won a poor race before. I wish it was Paul Nolan training uh, Captain yeah. T. It'd be your <laughs> favourite horse. Quality. But uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. I'll try and remember them. Uh, Lecky Watson and Ford got beat since. It's for me got beat since. Uh, the f- what's that? Four or five. The sixth horse was Captain Cody. Cody got well beat since. And also uh, Western Diego got beat since. Mm. So to me, I think the winner's very good, but I don't think it was a great race, no. Not sure when. I know he tends to run a couple in his puss. When Willie Mullins, you know, you look at the Fernie Hollow Appreciated year, he, he kind of just threw two yeah. very good darts at it. He ran nearly everything he had in the champion bumper last year, which would perhaps indicate he didn't have a, yeah. a standout at the time. And he didn't have the winner as well. So yeah. to show. And the other thing you have to know as well, Josh, is that this time last year nobody'd ever heard of him. Perry Pass, mm. he goes and bolts up in the Valley more. Willie has got another 20, 25, 30 horse from France. One of those could be the supreme winner. Exactly. Neil, 1977, asks Ballyburn for the Ballymore. Do you think he'll go to the Ballymore now? Have you come around to it a little bit? <laughs> Look, he's got a very good chance of going there. I just don't think it's as, as straightforward as that. I've seen before, at times, Willie tends to send a stare to the supreme and a speed horse to the Ballymore. You know, he's, he was ran in Perry Pass in a Ballymore last year. He's ended up, you know, he's being now targeted at a champion hurdle. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just, he, he has ran the likes of the Apprecia. Vatours of the world. Now, the year Vator won the Supreme, Faheen was in the Ballymore and they ended up being completely vice versa. So I just wouldn't rule out that uh, Ballyburn could end up in a Supreme. Do you think it- Ballyburn's speed or is he stamina? I think he's both. Uh, he's stamina because he won a point to point, but his two bumper wins, not overly impressive the first day, but he was impressive the next day mm-hmm. in a good race in Punchdown. Both of them two miles, they were on good heel and ground, so he definitely has gears. The problem is, if you back Ballyborn now for the Ballymore, what happens if he wins a two mile maiden hurdle? Okay? Willie has a habit, but when a horse wins at a trip, he can often leave him at that trip. Then he gets to go hard, one or two, and dominated that division that went up in trip for the Ballymore. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll find examples mm-hmm. of everything with Willie, right? But if, if Ballyborn wins a two mile maiden hurdle and then wins, say, the Supreme, or the the champion novice hurdle at Christmas over two miles. Well, you might just leave my two miles. Uh, 
it's definitely possible. Do you know what I mean? I just, I, I, just I, I got stung that way that um, two years ago, I think it was, after Dysart Dynamo won his bumper at Punchestown, packing for the Ballymore, ran in a two mile maiden hurdle, and then he won the, the Moscow Flyer by 20 lengths, and you know, there was no way in, in hell Willie Mullins was going to the You know, Willie doesn't that. always change them when they're winning, he just can leave them at that trip. And what would be your hunch? A dream to share or Ballyburn? If they were to run again in a bumper last year, who would have come out on top? I think a dream to share probably would have beaten them in a bumper, to be honest. Well, I, you know, I just think a dream to share has obviously got a slightly more flat pedigree. I, I just wonder about him against some of these horses that maybe will develop a little more in time. Hard to know. I, th I think the people that didn't think a dream to share was the best bumper horse last year probably thought Ballyburn was. I was definitely one of those, um, which is why those comparisons are like Ballyburn's the favourite for the, the Ballymore. I can understand why you're thinking the Ballyburn could be the best horse that comes out of bumpers last year. Yeah. How on earth can you look at a horse that's won two grade ones and a grade two yeah. bumper and say well, no, that he the, wasn't don't the best bumper as well, but as in, but as in, as in yeah. like both, he, he, Ballyburn won yeah. one winner's bumper, he, that's he, it. He's run, Ballyburn's run twice, obviously they are running graded bumpers, but some horses just don't simply go up into in, in grade as a grade as a, as a bumper. But just to say, if the handicap was involved, he would give a dream to share a higher rate than last year in Bally Warren, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Well, do you think that would, have, that would have reflected if they'd met? Uh, probably last year. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't think Bally Warren will end up a better hurdler. Um, a dream to share, like his half brother, the Joseph trains at rate 110 in the flat, so bumpers really suited him, uh, particularly last year. Bally Warren will be a better long term project, possibly. Neil also asks, where will the real wacker go? Let's talk of the Ryanair. Is there any chance to go that way? I don't know. Patrick Neville seems to be the type of trainer that wants to take on maybe the bigger targets and he wants to, to run this horse in the Gold Cup. And I'd say he'll run in a, in a Cotswolds chase, he'll probably keep the chopping point. I think, I think if, you, if you win an RSA, you go to the Gold Cup. It's just yeah. as simple as that. It reminds me of uh, Jamie Carr saying, Nobody wants to be a Gally Neville. It's, it's, it's like true. Nobody wants to be a Ryanair horse. It's, it's, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you, you, you couldn't blame Patrick Neville for think. having a swing. Oh, no, yeah, no, he goes to the Gold Cup unless he gets well beat or it doesn't stay. He's likely to bump into Cart Rambo at the end of the month at Kelso. Um, another horse that Lucinda Russell trains is Giovinco. Final question from Christian Barlow. He says, um, can we ask Gavin what do you think of Giovinco? I hope he's good enough for the Brown Advisory. Yeah, very, very good horse. Uh, ran three quick runs in the space of less than a couple of months. Was it uh, Perth, Carlisle and Perth, was it? Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Uh, his, his last win was very, very impressive. He won by 11 lengths, but it could have been another 20. Uh, the horse in second, I think, is rated 135. The third horse, Karen Funnock, is rated 120. Odd, so I think his rate was 146 or 7, I think, from last season. So. Lucinda Russell, yeah, he looks a right horse, yeah. Yeah, we spoke to Lucinda when we had to start the season, she was very, very excited about him. Right, I've got a bit of a, a game for you. I've so you up, haven't told us these names? I well. haven't told you these names, yeah. so, so I've come up with five head-to-heads this season, two horses in a similar division, right. and I want both of you to give your opinion on who you think will have a better season. Now, you can decide better season, what that means to you. Is it how many great ones they win? Is it prize money? Is it's it not necessarily winning at Cheltenham? Cheltenham. Because that's what most be, people think. It yeah. might be winning at Cheltenham, exactly. I want you to decide. You don't have to agree. If anything, a bit of debate would be lovely. Yeah. Um, the first one. You, you hold them and I'll hit them. Yeah. <laughs> the first one. Vassal Vega, Marie National. Who will have a better season? Well, I've always been in Marie National's camp. Um, I'm loath to give Vassal Vega my full trust after the Dublin Racing Festival. I understand what Gavin was saying about not a good prep for the Supreme as a result, but he's beaten fair and square. In fact, may even argue he got the run of the race and kick for home first. I think Marie National is fundamentally the better horse, and if he jumps as good, I think he will win. The only thing I would say about Marie National is I do have a fear we won't see him that many times. I think Barry Connell will, especially if those ones keep stacking up, will be pragmatic in where he goes. Detective? Slight. Like it was a long gap between the Royal Band and the Supreme last year or something. Uh, I go for me, National. Uh, I think that 
he has um, when a horse beats another horse to me the second horse ran is their full race but with the winner you never know if there's a little bit more so uh, it will come down to jumping if he jumps as well as Faso Vega there's no reason why he won't beat him again two votes from Marina for now the next one Imperial Pass or State Man Imperial Pass is that is that because we were thinking this on the podcast we spoke about it the other day there must have been a conversation with Willie and Paul Towner here. And Willie must have asked him, or, or there must have been some hint that Imperial Pass could be a better two mile hurdle than State Man, because if not, they would never would have gone down that route. Yeah, well, like State Man can't beat Constitution Hill. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Imperial Pass probably has a 10% chance mm. against 90% Con Hill, because he's as good a hurdler as I've seen. Um, but I'd be disappointed if Imperial Pass doesn't beat State Man. Do you think they'll meet before? Do they? Will they meet before at Leopardstown? They, those, they those? might meet in the Irish champion hurdle. Yeah. One will go more Guyana, one might go the Matheson, etc. etc. But Willie will want to find out, so he's done it before where he's put them against each other in, in the DRF. Now, I would think that if the show up there and the two of them have won at Christmas and in the Morgana, I think Paul would ride and carry a pass because he knows that Statement can't beat Nicky's horse. So. Patrick will be licking his lips at the Statement, right? Um, Statement or, or Imperial Pass? I know you love Statement. I do love Statement. I, I think he's a very, very good hurdler. Um, I know he can't be constitutional. I think Imperial Pass has to go and prove in open company if you if he thing with him very fast if he stopped his season after the Ballymore I'd have been a hundred percent yeah. In, in, in Gavin's camp. I just looked at I understand long hard season, get that, he might have been over the top well, of the punch. Funny, yeah. But he didn't look <coughs> like in any way like a two mile hurdler in that run. He looked lethargic, looked a bit behind the bridle. Now maybe that was just the tone of a season. But I agree with you, but the fact that Willie has gone down this route, yeah, it, you're kind of gone. Yeah. But my, I, just, my, I trust Willie's judgment I, as usual. I do, but my worry about that is if he Really thought in Perry passes the war. Would you not then kind of give Statement a go over fences? Because you know, there's an argument to suggest he could be well better than Marine National and Paso mm. Vega in a two mile obviously he jumps hurdles beautifully. So kind of if you didn't think he had a chance against Imperi Pass or Constitution Hill, are you just kind of playing around for place? I think you need to give Willie a buzz. Yeah. <laughs> be on next week. <laughs> um, El Fabiolo and Ergamy. El Fabiolo. Will the other one go to the right No. Both run in the champion Both chase. Both run in the champion chase. Cannot see that at all. Henry Gamin's going for three champion chases. His owner wouldn't allow it. Not two different owners, so they both run the champion chase. Again, it'll be the Hilly Wayne, it'll be the Dilebet, and it'll be the trying to avoid each other and all that. I would imagine the two of them will end up in the champion chase, and I'd be surprised if Paul didn't write the Fabiola, even though he's ridden yeah. Henry Gamin, so. I think when it comes to a champion chase, I think it'll be very great dependence. True. Uh, I think if it was soft ground, for a chance in chase, I, I would back an Ergamine all day, to be honest. I think he gets very little praise for what he's done. He's he got very lucky twice with the weather both Wednesdays, hasn't he? He yeah. has the better season. An Ergamine for me. It's interesting. I disagree with the first one. Yeah, it, it's interesting <laughs> as well, though. I think Willie's going to do, he's going to use Dice Art Dynamo as his scapegoat horse. He'll, he's he'll going to run in the English race. races yeah. and kind of get a feel for the form yeah. and maybe try to upset John Bond along the way. I'm pretty sure plans are to run Dice Art Dynamo in the Tingle Creek and, okay. and see what happens there. Would John Bond be there? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Jerry Colo and Brave Man's Gay. Brave Man's game for me. I would say Brave Man's game because he'll probably win the King George. Uh, Jerry Colon looks slow at Cheltenham, but then uh, looks have more gears than entry, a better ride perhaps. Um, they might meet in the back there, James. Good. They could. Don't think they will. Do you think Brave Man's game, this is all talk, and it just goes to Charlie Hall? Yes. I must admit, Brave Man's game is my favourite horse in training. I'm absolutely petrified if he turns up on heavy ground at Adolf. I know it's not too long ago, and I know, I know it's not too long away, and I know the ground is beautiful outside, so it's good yes. to yes. firm yes. rather than heavy. I just fear that that bet fair chase might be really good protector at runs. You've got uh, Jerry running, a couple of others. I worry that Ray Band's game might just have a really hard race. Like you look at the Charlie Hall last year, he had to beat a Hoyt in your El Dorado Allen. 
it was a penalty kick from what we found out later that season with how good he has been. I just worry, I, I wonder if he was to get into horrid conditions at Hayed off against good horses, whether he might... Shishkin's not going to go to the Bethlehem Chase, and he is probably going to go to the Oaksy Chase, I imagine, over 2-5 at Ascot, and then go up and trip to the King George. That might be the perfect um, route there, and Brave Man's game might end up having a really tough race. And that didn't help Clanders over and horses like that towards the latter end of their career. No, it didn't. Um, and just to say one thing is uh, well done to HRI, whoever that does the race schedule. The fact that they've put a couple of weekends of two meetings together, like two Navins, nice. two Funches Towns, and also they brought forward the John Durkin, which means that ours can run in the John Durkin and one of Christmas, whether it be a King George or Golden Leopardstown, etc. So, some very good race planning. Okay, final one. Ballyburn versus a dream to share. We have touched on this. Who's going to have the best season? Ballyburn, I think. Um, I think it'll just. I think he'll excel over hurdles. Um, it's very hard to know, obviously, at this early stage. Uh, one of our great friends, Jake Price, has been kind of banging on about um, a dream to share sire and that is, you know, the jumping progeny has been useless. <laughs> and I think the best rate of herd or the, that the sire has produced is rated 108 or yeah. something like that, which is, you know, I don't really look into that stuff massively, but it might be a, a tiny bit of a concern that he's more flat red bumpers would have suited a dream to share down to the ground. And I'd be a little bit surprised if something, whether it's a, a bumper horse from last year or whether it's a French or something, doesn't come and usurp him. As for Ballyburn, could easily win a race at John. Ballyburn, a dream to share. I think that last year, uh, ideal conditions for a dream to share with bumpers. So uh, the other fellow's more national and bred. So I'd go for Ballyburn just about. Mm. Uh, I think he's going to be an outstanding horse, particularly in a year or two's time. Yeah, very, very excited about him. And before we do finish up this video, I want to say a big thank you to the Sydney Arms first and foremost for having us. But Chepstow this weekend, it feels it would, it would feel wrong not to touch on it slightly, especially the Englishman in the room. We do need to. This is this is our starting point. Really, we've got Cheltenham in a couple he of weeks. Knows time. Some yeah. England, <laughs> the Englishman and the we've got no Welsh blood. Um, I quite like United Kingdom. Man. Yeah. The, the British uh, yes. man in the room. Um, I quite like two horses, um, both trained by Paul Nichols. Obviously, we know that I have a love affair with Paul Nichols. Jesus, yeah. Gavin just you're, you're said no sentimental. <laughs> you're as bad as him with Paul Nolan. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I'm Barry Connolly. Yeah, Gordon, so. Gordon Elliott and Paul Nichols are, are my, <coughs> my weaknesses. Um, sounds strange. Um, but um, I, I, I just think that Paul Nichols loves to target this meeting. Um, He's dominated the, the British race we've seen in the last few years, and it's only getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, the first race of veterans chase, I think Danny Kerwin's 15 to two. I quite like him. He ran a massive race at Ascot in his reappearance last year. Loves good ground, loves three miles. He's hurt me a few times in the past. He doesn't always go through with it. He's 15 to two against older horses. Never ran a veteran chase before. I quite like that angle. Ten-year-olds love that race, and I think Harry Cobden will ride. So tick, tick, tick for me. Goes back fresh. Never been to check though, one slight doubt. Um, and then my other one would be in the four-year-old handicap hurdle on Saturday, if Affordil runs. I think he's better than 128. I'd imagine Harry Cobden a ride. I think Lorcan Williams a ride Blue King Daru, the top weight of 138, which would give uh, Affordil 10 pounds. And I think it also pushes the Nicky Henderson horse out of the handicap. So I, I like that angle. I think Affordil's got a, a good bit of improvement doing this year. And, and 128 wouldn't surprise me if he was to go and win on Saturday and then maybe even look at a great return or something like that in a month's time. Uh, you, you said there that Danny Kerwin doesn't often go through with it. Can you name me on one hand <laughs> the amount of times he's actually gone through? He, he, has he hasn't won, won a race in four seasons. He has won five uh, races under rules out of 19 and I think the last one was say, 18 months ago so I'm hoping he fancies first time up at Chester to make me happy. Up that hill. Up that hill. Yeah. <laughs> I'm convinced he'll love that place. He, he, he agrees, yeah, I was just going to say. Exactly. I'd say his name must be Danny Kerwin. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my one best would be against you in that veterans chase. Um, similar enough angle though in terms of a, a newer horse into that, that sphere. 
high rise of 150. It's been an incredibly consistent horse, goes well fresh. Uh, one time favourite for the Ultima, I think two seasons ago, where he came third. He won a Sky Bet chase. He started off last season off 156, he's off 150. Ryan Manio is usual rider rides. Harry Graham wouldn't have many horses that go down to run in Chepster, so I think that's interesting. He's a standout 7 to 1, generally 5s. I think that's a very fair price. Anything for Chepster? Uh, no bet. But Looking be forward to seeing. seeing uh, does Captain T run Friday? I think he does, yeah, in the Persian. What do you think of that? Grade two, two and a half miles, first time up. Yeah, oh. it'll be interesting to see because as I said I have my doubts over the Cheltenham bumper farm. The winner not so much, but the rest of them, particularly the ones in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Uh, so yeah, we're just interested to see him running, yeah. But I know that. Yeah, it looks like he's going to be up against Skelton's Rock House and uh, maybe Johnny Who as well as John Joe. So it'll be interesting to see how that, that all pans out. Um, we do hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Gavin. And can I just say to you, you're two tremendous fellows, that it's great to be seeing young lads, which you are, uh, carrying the, the torch for race and promoting and talking about it so much. So well done. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very kind of you. Thank you for sitting on for having us. Thanks, Gavin, for coming over and speaking to us. We do hope you enjoyed. If you do, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I should say a big thank you to you as well. I know you're ah, no, as well. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just filling up space. Uh, we do hope you enjoy and we will definitely see you soon. See you in a bit.